We just changed the tape. Okay. Uh, <laughs> again, and uh, and uh, there, there's uh, there's still that mm. thing lacking with mm. uh, most drummers over there. There's some very good drummers. Daniel Umer. Daniel Umer is marvelous. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, but in general. There are in general, that, they, that thing. Yeah, John Engels is a good drummer, a very good drummer from Holland. Yes, and, he is. Uh, and uh, but but they're all far apart. I mean, like you know, one drummer here in this country, one drummer in that country. You know, yeah. you mm -hmm. can't get two in one city. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. So uh, it starts to tell, and uh, and you know, when when a, a great drummer like like Kenny Clark, and if he would have stayed here. Who's to know how how much greater he would have become? Yeah. Because when he left, he was great, but now he had to go play with actually inferior musicians. Was it a conscious thing on his part? I mean, it it, it must have been the rejection of the tom toms. He never touches the tom toms. Yeah, I never understood rarely. that either. Yeah, I'm especially curious. when they're there. You know, when he had them set on his drums. What kind of drum set did he play? Like when you toured with with his opposite his band? Did you? Uh, over there, I think he had. I think he had Sonar, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably uh, Sonar, the German drum. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, what kind of setup? Like the like the same kind oh, of the, yeah, the, the, the Buddy and Gene piece, play? Four piece drum set, you know, two yeah. tom toms and all that. He had the two toms. Yet I never heard him use them on that record. Uh, and uh, which might be might be why they hired Kenny Clare. It's very possible that the fact that Kenny used his whole drum set and played all those fills with the toms and all that, yeah. and they could hear that stuff. Obviously, by all the records we heard here today of Kluke, he didn't really touch Tom Toms. I guess maybe he didn't like them. Hmm. You know, he was a real snare drum man. You know, nothing wrong with that. Hmm. But because his great thing was still that cymbal. Yeah. I think I, I, I almost got to say that he probably had, you know, that's one of the greatest cymbal beats of all time. You know, definitely. Yeah. We're talking with Mel Lewis about the history of jazz drums. And right now we're going to go to another chapter, a very important chapter, Max Roach. And looking at the time, that it's 8.23, oh, wow. and that we have... Uh, well, let's uh, do as much time, as we can Time today. flies. Yeah, Amazing. let's do as much as we can. Yeah, we got about half an hour, yeah, and we'll we can pick start up... start off with Max next week. Right where we end today. Right. We'll pick up Tuesday at noon. So we'll, we'll do the early years of Max Roach tonight, right now. And uh, we're going to begin with one of his very first record sessions. Not the first, but one of the first. It's, it was done before he made Coco with Charlie Parker. This is with an all-star band out on the West Coast. Max Roach was a member of the Benny Carter Big Band, and Capitol Records decided to do an all-star record session, so they had Bill Coleman on trumpet, uh, Buster Bailey on clarinet, Benny Carter on the alto, Coleman Hawkins on tenor, and the rhythm section, I think, is... Um, oh, my God, I'm blanking out who's in the rhythm section. Max Roach on drums. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah I know it's Max. Oh, Nat Cole. Oh. Nat Cole, John Kirby, and John Collins, or something ah. like that. Okay. Yeah, so we get to hear... Max Roach, as a very young man, about 20 years old or so, playing here in a style that's a little reminiscent of Big Sid Catlett. Okay. I think you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll like to hear this. Early Max Roach, this is called Riffermerol. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
See. Now, I heard I heard some touches of what was to come. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I heard every every once in a while I heard a little a little uh an offbeat bass drum thing and one of those uh, one of the things he became famous for later like ch you know like chugong you know and uh, placed in just a certain in just a certain way that was a uh, uh, and of course, his top. Then he went top simple, and he played hi hat. He played closed hi hats. He played open hi hats. He and, and, and he played uh, the the top symbol. Yeah. But his between his left hand and his bass drum, he every once in a while, he played a little fill like on one or four. That was what was to come. I mean, I it was a very quite modern. Yeah. But he wasn't too busy, so he wasn't into it yet. Right. But neither were these guys. He was actually working. To with Buster with Bailey, yeah, and he played. Of, yeah. He played for them, you know, and that—that's of course what it's supposed to be. So yeah. he wasn't—he wasn't trying to put anything on them, at all. He did his job. Yeah, and uh, it was nice, you know. But I did hear a couple of little things. Yeah, yeah. Well, right now we're going to forge right ahead later the same year. That was early 1945. This is from November 26, 1945. The very famous uh, record of Coco. And uh, the great thing about Max Roach's career was that he really was captured at virtually every stage of his early development. You have him here, now we have him with Charlie Parker, playing one way with Burden Diz, and then when you get to the dial records a couple of years later, yeah. he changed again. And had, yeah, and uh, then the other thing... He kept you know, growing and growing. Yeah, the other thing know. on that other record, uh, just quickly, is that the guitar sort of... Sounded like a yeah, washboard. Yeah, it tightened everything up. Uh, it yeah. didn't allow the freedom that he might have had, you know. Yeah. Well, there's no guitar here. Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker on trumpet and alto at the beginning, and then Dizzy switches over to the piano, comping behind Charlie Parker. And uh, the bassist is Curly Russell and uh, Max Roach on drums. So actually, it's, it's just four musicians. And uh, we'll hear the original version of Coco, but we'll hear first, it just takes 38 seconds, it's fascinating, uh, if it hadn't been for producer Teddy Rieg and Herman Lubinsky's uh, insistence on not recording standards so he didn't have to pay royalties to the <laughs> composers, uh, we wouldn't have had Coco named Coco because it's obvious from this that they meant it to be Cherokee. Because Cherokee, yeah. they start playing Cherokee and then you can hear them go, yep. and then they start again with just <laughs> when they cut out the melody. Yeah, I don't want to pay that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, he's you know, supposed to, he'd have to pay the guys for the tune they wrote, but he probably figured he could get away yeah, with oh, yeah, that, sure. as they well did. As they said, he was really a... a a monster, but I never met the man, so I no. shouldn't say. No, they all were. <laughs> Let's hear Coco right now.
it's, it's, it's a very deceptive uh, introduction, but it's right in time. And uh, see, what Max had then, see, uh, he was my favorite. I, I uh, he just turned my turned me completely around. All of a sudden, I wanted to be a drummer like that. I wanted to play bebop, you know, and I and I wanted to play that kind of music, and because of him. See, not uh, Kluk was not my inspiration at all in those days. Max Roach was, and uh, Max was only about four years older than me. And I think that's all he is really now. But in those <laughs> days, four years was old, was you know I was sixteen. He was and he 20, was twenty one, twenty one, twenty one, something like that, five years. But uh, this was different. Now this is really different drumming, you know. And it's smooth as silk, and it flows, and that open hi hat, and then, 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 then moving over to the uh, to the ride cymbal, and the simpleness of the uh, of the uh, lines he was playing underneath the, the snare drum it was not very busy. Uh, the, the the main flow still came off of the cymbals and all that, but the bombs were dropped in uh, in uh, unusual places, you yeah. know, which was nice. You know, like bon, to, oh, you know, uh, oh, to, oh, you know, just to, just to give a little more movement and not loud, right. you know, and the drum solo uh, is uh, it, it sounds like it's rushing at one point, but it's not really. It's 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 like an over the bar thing because when the band because the group came in right on one, just where they're supposed to come in because I was beating time right here and it, right. it just he was just playing he played some funny thing that. That went over a bar line and it gives you that effect, right? But it, you know, and it was and it was it was different, you know, and that's what knocked me out when I first heard it. You know? Yeah, it's so elegant. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, it was really it's really something. Yeah, it has, there was an elegantness, el elegantness to it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, elegance. And, well, Max is sort of an elegant guy, anyway. You know, I mean, yeah, he's, he's really. Oh yeah, it all comes out. Yeah. Uh, it's eight thirty-five, and we're going to forge ahead here some more. Max with birds, so we can talk some more about this great. very, very special thing that happened. You know, every so often, uh, one of the great, it seems like all the great jazz horn players are linked with a drummer. I mean, with Louis Armstrong, it was Zooty Singleton and, uh, yeah. and, and Big Sid, and uh, with Lester Young, it was definitely Joe Jones. And with Charlie Parker, it really seems to have been Max, I mean, it was Max Roach. He, yeah, he's quoted on many occasions as yeah. saying, you know, it was his yeah, favorite no, drummer. Max and was his favorite. And if, if, and if he wasn't, he should have been. Nobody was. But he certainly was. Yeah. <laughs> Elvin Jones and, 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 and uh, Coltrane, Coltrane. And, 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 and the list goes on. Uh, let's listen to some very well-recorded uh, examples of Max Roach with the Charlie Parker band. As most folks know, in the Charlie Parker recorded predominantly up until 1949 for either Savoy Records or for Dial Records. And uh, the engineer for the Dial Records was a guy named Doug Hawkins, who was, a, I believe, a classical musician or something like that. And he knew a lot about sound, and he captured the drums and the cymbals in a way on the dials that didn't get captured on the Savoys. Yeah. You really can't hear the uh, Savoy's too much. Always, uh, Savoy Records didn't even look good in those <laughs> days. The, the 78s, yeah, they were all raggedy. They had yeah. rough edges on them, I remember. Great music, but uh, <laughs> not always recorded or packaged. Yeah the best but you the reason we're going to take the dials is because you can hear the drums better so let's listen to a couple of tracks and uh we'll chart the progression between what we just heard which we have to remember is max roach is a very young guy i mean you know he's charting new territory and he was 20 years old or 21 here he is uh in his early 20s now and he's changed there's more stuff going on here and we'll listen for the integration of the drums to the rest of the band on this we'll begin with Qua uh not quasimodo crazeology and again, the focus is on the drums. This one will be the famous quintet of Duke Jordan, Tommy Potter, Max Roach, Charlie Parker, and Miles Davis, plus, on this track, guest J.J. Johnson.
just heard three of the classic dial 78s with Charlie Parker with Max Roach on drums. We heard uh, Crazology, Clack David, said Steen, and uh, Dewey Square. You know, uh, this, is, this is where you could really tell how uh, musical uh, Max's mind was, you know, because every fill, every fill, every little, t every little thing that happened uh, yep. from beginning to end on, the, on all three charts there, and, and, during, the, and during the solos uh, meant something. That's right. Uh, it showed how how uh, big his ears were and all that, and and also you know it's wild as you know, I'm hearing you know, uh, Max's Max's cliches. We'll we'll call him that just for the sake of right. That he was laying down then in those days. Those they were new. Right. They were innovative. You know, da da ba ba. You know, and uh, cha cha cha. You know, and uh, uh, just little things that young drummers today right are are doing. You know, and they're doing it either because they heard these records somehow or other. They got to finally sit down and listen to them, or, 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 or it's been passed around. You know, where they heard right, everybody third hand. It. But I mean, it, today, uh, forty years later, you know, forty is more than forty years, isn't it? Just, just, just forty years. Forty years later, 
these things are still happening among other drummers, young drummers, you know, are playing what Max played okay. for the first time yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. Which shows how, la the, the, how it lasted, you know. I mean, the only thing is, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the young drummers today don't know how and where to use these things, you know. That's still always the problem. They'll learn as they get, get older, you know. The more they play, they'll learn that you can't just play a Max Roach lick anywhere. It's got to be where it belongs, you know. It's like a great Shakespeare line or a great joke by W.C. Fields. I mean, it's it, it it's where it happens. It's where it's, it's, it's a it. line by itself doesn't yeah. mean anything if it's not in the right See. place. But it's also musical. I know what you're saying. And of course, his solos, you know, were so different from anybody else's, you know, and and his the way he broke the he used to break the time up, you know, and do all these, you know, you know, all the it, it was it was it was so fresh and different, you know, and and challenging, you know, and and you wondered how half of it worked or how it came out or or, or would it come out. But it always did. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this to me was new. This was completely a whole new way to play the drums. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was so important, you know, that. Uh, and he was so young, you know. I mean, where'd he get it from? I gotta, I gotta call him and ask him someday, you know, and, and just say, Max, where did you get these ideas? I mean, where, where, where did it happen? You know. Yeah. I, he probably couldn't even say. He probably. Came I, from within. I, I think it just it was within him and. Uh, it's just a combination of uh, of just being a, a being a real good musician and being a real good drummer, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and, and being willing to take chances. That's yeah. another thing. And being know. encouraged. Oh sure. Getting you to know. play with Charlie Parker. Well, if you play that. with Charlie Parker, man, you got to be you got to be as good a drummer as Charlie Parker as an alto player, and of course he lived up to it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I can also hear on these records the uh, the the seeds of of you know the whole. Uh, the later development to Tony Williams and Elvin Jones and the later develop what what people later took in the same way that Kenny Clark took something from uh, Joe Jones or whoever and made it a just put it made it more of an important thing. Yeah. People took elements of what Max was doing here and, sure. and and developed them, and you can just hear that free time thing, you know, all throughout. Like when he'll you know uh, when he'll go over the eight measure phrases, he'll just play something that goes over it, you know, it doesn't make a difference. I'll tell you something else he was doing, he was using two ride cymbals, see, I would think he was one of the first guys to do that, I didn't hear that on any of the Kluke records, I heard it on, Ma on Max, he played different, he had two ride cymbals and a hi-hat, and he used them, Yeah. you know, and uh, he, had, he, had, he had, the you know, the cymbal over on the left, to play behind the piano, no, the piano, he went to the hi-hat, uh, open hi-hat. Yeah, beautiful hi-hat work. Yeah, uh, and, uh, Oh, he was always a big fan of the hi hat. You know, that's he, one of his, one of his uh, famous uh, in-person deals when he does his tribute to, to Joe, Joe Jones. It's right. just, it, you know, and uh, then he has a uh, uh, he has a, a little heavier symbol, a small a small but heavier symbol on the left, which we mm -hmm. all, every you know, that's that. I know that's where I got it from. I, I'm sure I don't remember, but I'm positive it's where. I'm, right. where you go to that little lighter sound on the you know. Right. Over, Behind certain people, behind a muted trumpet or, or somebody that's not going to play loud, and then you got, then you're bare down on the one on the right, you know, yeah. which is your deeper symbol with more ring to it. When did you see Max Roach for the first time, Mel? First time I saw him was with Charlie Parker in Buffalo. Uh, uh, oh, it had to be forty-five, I guess. Uh, uh, wait a minute, when was Al Haig playing piano with him? Uh, late forty-eight. No, well, I, I was on the road already, so it had yeah. To be. I think Al Haig was there in 45 and then again in, in about 48. I, I, uh, he must have been there in 45. And Curly Russell was playing bass, mm. and uh, they came yeah. through Buffalo. And I'm trying to remember who played Tron. Kenny Dorham or somebody? Well, if it was Kenny Dorham and, and uh, Al Haig, then that definitely would have been uh, 48. Is that I was, that's uh, impossible? I was, a, I was in New York already. You were gone already. Yeah, this, yeah, I was gone. No, this was in Buffalo Yeah. in 45 at a breakfast dance. Mm-hmm. So I just don't remember who was on the stand. It must have re really struck you though, just hearing hear oh. this in person for the first and Max time. Max only had uh, he had a uh, he had a bass drum and a, I don't know if it was a borrowed set from somebody or what or that's all he brought with him. But uh, all I remember was a, a bass drum cymbal and a snare drum and a hi hat. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Frank Dunlop was there that night. We were both there standing right in front. Yeah. Right in front of the drums. I guess it wasn't Al Haig on piano then. Couldn't have been. 
could have been someone else. Yeah, because yeah. I saw the group a lot of times. But yeah. Max was there. That's no, the important it was Max. Thing. Yeah. So, you know, that's, it was my thrill that night. But it was when I was still living in Buffalo. And I, I, at 48, I was gone. Long gone, as a matter of fact. I've been on the road since 46. So it had to be 45. I'd like to, to, to play one more track of Max Roach before we end this show, which is part four of our continuing history of the jazz drums with Mel Lewis. Lauren Schoenberg with you. And we're going to head out of here pretty quick. We're going to be back Tuesday from noon to 3 and pick up where we left off with Max Roach. But I'd like to play one more, which just shows another aspect. And uh, one of the band leaders that, uh, whose, whose band Mel Lewis you know, highlighted was the great Jerry Mulligan concert band. And uh, earlier on, J Jerry Mulligan had written about how Max Roach, when Max Roach played Mulligan's Arrangements in the Miles Davis Nonette, he said, like, opened his mind up. He had no idea, you know, that that the drums, just through the interpretation of what the drums were doing, could show him something about his own arrangement that he didn't even know. So I'd like to play the Miles Davis, what's known now as the Birth of the Cool Band, uh, playing, I think it's Giroux with Max Roach on drums. And uh, we can listen to the drums on this track in an orchestral sense, in other words, how he's commenting on what on the written music. Okay, and he played the arrangement beautifully. I mean, uh, the, all, all Jerry was right. Uh, you know, the fills were also tasteful, yeah. and 
Uh, you could tell he, first of all, he knew it. He knew the arrangement, and that's very important because that's an arrangement. It's a, that's a little big band. You know. Composition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the drummer must know what's going on, you know. And it doesn't matter of reading, you know, because reading doesn't, just, uh, it's your ears, you know, knowing what's actually happening because what you're going to play has nothing to do with, with what's on the part. It's what you hear. And uh, he certainly was hearing. So and free. Yeah. yeah. I saw the, I saw that him with that group uh, at the Royal Roost. In fact, I was there their opening night. As a man, that was their only engagement. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was and it was a groove, you know. To, yeah. To, to to know the you know to be there. First, I was there opening night, and I was there about a couple of nights later. I caught him a couple of times. Yeah, it was amazing because they were playing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, against Char Charlie Parker's group, and Max was playing with both, both of them, groups, and Miles yeah. had just yeah. left. And yeah and all that stuff must have been fascinating but just the the total musicality of the drumming on those records and uh, the fact that they're so uh, cliche free yeah i mean they're just so yeah that so was fresh in, that was 1948 and yeah it was right after i played my my first gig at the savoy ballroom yeah you know, we i think it was september 48 if i'm not mistaken like when they opened and these recordings were made just a little bit later yeah. oh look at the time it's 8 59 we gotta wow. get out of here get so out. Bye, everybody. Mel, thanks. So long. So Lauren, long. It was great, man. Yes, and uh, we'll do part five on Tuesday at noon. Right. So onward and upward, everybody, and best wishes, and uh, we'll see you Tuesday. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. We'll go out with a little bit of Charlie Parker.